obviously there are kind of really big challenges facing facing us as uh, not just as consumers but as citizens as well and as societies uh, uh, because of everything that is happening around us uh, the digital has become kind of a ubiquitous presence in our lives so uh, the erosion in tr uh, of trust is kind of one big thing that we did mention several times and it's something there are certain things of that that are tend to tended to be presented as the, the stuff of sci-fi and whoever's going to watch Black Mirror, we were kind of seeing those things, very plausible kind of done, but still we're kind of thinking mm, it's kind of in the future and probably just kind of uh, uh, the work of fiction. But some of the aspects of actually Black Mirror have arrived, we know that now. And uh, part, of, part of the story and part of the reason is that as one Kevin Kelly once kind of remarked, things were kind of first getting electrified, then they got digitized, and now they are getting cognitized meaning that we've got more and more thinking or smart things around us. And that basically creates a new set of challenges. In other words, um, they are getting smarter, not just about how we use them, but also they are, uh, uh, started getting smarter about uh, the mood of the information, to use Andrew's phrase. Information has mood. And the systems are getting cleverer and cleverer in reading those moods. And if that mood could be used, and, and read and used, it could be used for good purposes, but also could be abused. So um, that means that the media overall becoming more empathic. And Andrew um, is in many ways kind of leading the way in devising and developing that new field of empathic media, as well as the set of guidelines for the ethical uh, practices in, in that space and also ethical pra practices around artificial intelligence. So as our closing keynote speaker for today, uh, Professor Andrew McStay, Professor of Digital Life from Bangor University. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, yeah, I think um, a few thank yous first. Um, firstly, um, thank you to the team and thank you for everybody who's put this event on. We've really, really enjoyed ourselves. Um, yeah, thank you. The organization, everything has been top notch. I think, you know, just before I kind of get going, it's worth kind of reflecting on some of the topics that have come up today. Um, I think, you know, Lazar, you kind of talked about the past always being present. I think that's something that's going to come up in the next half an hour or so. Deji you talked about interest in public spaces um, and kind of protection and kind of citizen rights and um, the need for public interest. I think that's going to come up as well. And we heard a lot about the kind of changing nature of advertising experiences as well. And that's something that I'm going to explicitly focus on. But I think in the critical panel um, that we had after the two keynotes, there were some really important questions that came up there, particularly around questions of liberal choice, around questions of the audience as commodity. And I thought there was one really interesting idea that came up, that claim that the claim that when we talk about digital, there's an absence of corporeality. And I'm, I'm going to challenge that one, because there was a talk about this need to return to the organic. And to an extent, I agree, we do need to return to the organic. But I think in kind of classic Star Wars parlance, uh, what I'll be presenting is not the return to the organic that you're looking for. So. Without further ado, let me kick off. So essentially what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna talk through some work that I've been doing in relation to technologies that detect and interact with human emotion. I'm specifically gonna focus on advertising, but as we'll see in a moment, there are a lot of other applications as well. Okay. But I think as, a, as an element of framing, we've been, we've had some optimism today, but mostly it's been pretty pessimistic in relation to modern technology. You know, I kind of sit somewhere between these. You know, in terms of certainly kind of within the West, um, there's a long line of writing on technology, which is typically male, um, and it's typically quite pessimistic, and it tends not to deal in the specifics of technologies. It tends to deal with the principle of technology itself. So I'm thinking of kind of people like Jacques Allou, I'm thinking about people like Martin Heidegger, I'm thinking about people like Deleuze, and they tend to deal with kind of technology as a sole thing. Um, yeah, they're pretty, they're pretty kind of um, pessimistic about this stuff. And then I think, you know, we've heard some stuff about the technological optimist today, the technological solutionist, and I don't buy that view either. I think the answer is somewhere in between. And I think when we think about technologies that interact and sense emotion, I think the same applies as well. 
in that there are kind of both positive and negative dimensions, and we'll, we'll talk about a few of those. So in terms of some academic framing, this is an academic conference after all. I think in terms of some kind of steering thoughts and some steering thinking, um, this notion of valence. We've heard surveillance has come up a few times, but I kind of prefer the, note, the word of valence because valence kind of means multi-directional watching. So it means watching the watchers as well as being watched. It means watching in all directions. And I think if, some, if there's a, a word that kind of really kind of helps us understand um, post-digital life, it's an overall net increase in watching. Um, this notion of affective computing, the idea of kind of emotion sensing technologies is not new. Um, so Rosalind Pigard, she's based at MIT. She's been working on this stuff since 1995. Um, notably, she's a woman as well. We don't hear enough um, about women in AI. Um, Rosalind Pigard is essentially the mother of affective computing. Mark Andrejevich, who's based at uh, Monash, he's talked a lot uh, about affective capitalism. When we talk about affective capitalism, it's kind of something more than just capitalism itself. It's kind of stuff that involves the body. Um, so rather than being about thinking about advertising in terms of text, we're thinking about experience, we're thinking about bodies, we're thinking about the datification of these. Uh, okay. okay. And then, yeah, these two, these two notions that are um, uh, kind of expressions that, that I found, this notion of empathic media. So the idea of empathic media essentially has to do with uh, technologies that feel into the body. And I think that's, that's if, we, if we want to kind of think about what kind of the a trend is going to be over the next few years, it's about technologies that sense and track and feel into the body. And this is achieved by what I term emotional AI. So this takes affective computing, but it also takes machine, machine, machine learning techniques, combines these, and really brings together what yeah, I term emotional AI. So in terms of who's using emotion sensing technologies, there's a wide variety of actors. So you see advertising on the top left, and that's where most of the conversation has been today. But there's some outliers there. So look at education, for example. Um, emotion sensing technologies, increasingly an issue in, um, in education. Automotive and insurance, also key areas to track in-car reactivity, to understand driver stress, to change the levels of your insurance. So again, this is a big area. And so the number of startups working in this area, but also a number of legacy car makers as well. I think the gaming point is a particularly interesting one because it kind of shows the positives of some of these technologies in that gaming with biometrics can be fun. Assume that, that, that the data stays on your device and doesn't go any further. Using heart rate, using kind of facial expressions, using respiration to interact with um, gaming is quite a fun thing to do. So again, I, I see why I, can't, I don't go for the, um, the, the, pe the pessimistic angle. But yeah, some strange things. Sex tech is another big area um, for these types of technologies, and kind of something that you wouldn't kind of necessarily expect. Toys and manufac toy manufacturers, again, also um, exploring affective computing, emotional eye, in quite significant ways. But I'm, for, I'm for talking about advertising today, so just a little bit about gla grand clearance uh, about what I'm referring to. So behavioral advertising is simply this. It tracks online website. It uses cookies to track where you go online. And it does this by de depositing a small string of code that identifies you to different servers as you move across the web. Programmatic advertising is something that's slightly different because it doesn't just make use of web-based protocols. Rather, it involves apps and different devices and different screens. And the idea is to serve you the right message to the right person at the right time. So again, it's kind of a little bit kind of more broader, but there's a key logic with programmatic advertising that we really should kind of take into account. And it's that it's a plug and play system. Apologies if you can't see that at the back. All it says there is that the key is that it's a plug and play system. So programmatic advertising essentially is able to receive data from all different types of devices. And that includes biometrics, it includes all sorts of different data. So programmatic advertising, although we kind of think of it in relation to apps and, and save, serving ads online, the logic is a little bit broader in that you can plug different devices, you can plug different data types in to help tailor, refine, personalize advertising to serve the right message to the right person at the right time. So what that means, what we're seeing in the UK is uh, a development in how 
digital advertising is done. So what you're looking at here, you're looking at, um, you're looking at Oxford Street within London, and you're looking at a lady who's, um, who's waiting at a bus shelter, and what we have here, there's a camera there that in essence is looking back at her, watching her facial expression. And the idea is that the camera collects facial expressions, and then as more people look at the ad, the ad will change itself, and it will change itself to elicit more smiles over the course of a day. So in essence, what you have is A, behavioral advertising, and B, reactive advertising that changes itself, it optimizes itself to improve effectiveness and performance. This for me is really significant. This is 2015. The advertising agency is MNC Saatchi. Um, this, is, as far as I'm aware, is the first example of advertising that optimizes itself to elicit more positive reactions. So this for me is a bit of a, a landmark case. But just to reiterate, is in essence what it does, there's a little Microsoft Connect camera. All it's doing is looking for indication of positive emotions. And that in essence means the face moving to smile more. Another example, this is from Mindshare. Mindshare is, um, is a global agency. Uh, they did something slightly different. They also used cameras. Um, this is at Wimbledon, sorry, I should explain. This is at uh, so Wimbledon UK Tennis Festival. Um, and yeah, they had kind of cameras set up around the Wimbledon tennis event. But they also used voice analytics as well to measure kind of um, the overall reactivity of the crowd. And Mindshare also hooked up 20 people uh, who opted in. Um, to have their biometrics read, as the, t as the kind of, as kind of Wimbledon would say. You can picture it, your favorite tennis player, you know, kind of everybody's getting excited, it's the last game point, and then you can see kind of emotion, piking and uh, peaking um, and depressing, depend depending on who your favorite tennis player is. Um, the client here was Jaguar. In essence, what they did, they used the emotional data to inform their kind of social media um, campaign, but the, but the principle to take away is the use of out-of-home analytics um, to serve advertising. That's the key principle. So this is where we are today. Um, and I think for me, you know, the, the previous examples were from 2015, 2016, and you know, they felt a little bit gimmicky. They felt a bit kind of speculative. They were kind of, they were, te they were kind of proof of concepts, if you like. But this is something bigger. So um, this is from Piccadilly Circus, also in London. Uh, this also uses emotion tracking, but this does it at scale. So whereas the last example, the first example you saw, was about one person stood in front of a bus shelter. This is about all passers-by in London's Piccadilly Circus. The cameras are mounted here, um, just above the Gap store. And in essence, what they do, they track moods, whether people are looking, emotions, age, and gender of people looking at the screens. The poster site is owned by um, a company called Land Security, um, the outdoor um, advertisers who own the advertising site itself is called Ocean Outdoor. So they, Ocean Outdoor, deliver the advertising experience. The physical infrastructure is owned by Land Securities. But again, this for me kind of feels really significant um, that we're kind of we are kind of pivoting. We are seeing a change in the nature of out of home advertising. So whereas historically. You know, we've accepted out-of-home advertising. We actually, I actually quite like out-of-home advertising. When I spend time in New York, Times Square, it's brilliant. I love walking through Times Square. But I love it as a spectacle. I love it on the basis that I can look at, I can take pleasure, and then I can walk away. I don't expect advertising to be looking back at me when I'm in a public space. That is arguably problematic. Now, it's probably worth mentioning at this point that it doesn't collect personal data. So by personal data, personal data is data that in some way identifies you, something about you or your device, or singles out, it singles you or your device out in some way, shape, or form. That's not the way these technologies work. The way that these technologies work is, I think it's on the next slide, but in essence, it kind of, it kind of picks off data points around your eyes, around your nose, and around your mouth. But the data that's collected cannot be linked back to any living person or a given device. So in essence, what we have, we have kind of out-of-home profiling, which is collecting really intimate data because it's about human emotion. 
but it's not personal, so it's legal. So um, regulatory structures such as GDPR and e-privacy, they don't apply, because if it's not personal, it's not a question to be asked. So I think this for me is interesting. I've talked to UK advertising regulators about this, and you know, what their attitudes, and it's, the conversations have been pretty interesting, because when I brought this up to them a few years ago, they were kind of pretty horrified, but now as they're kind of hearing a few more of their clients doing some of this stuff, yeah, um, their, 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 um, their ethical stance isn't quite as strong as it once was. But we'll see, the, those conversations are ongoing. But they do have um, a privacy notice, which is really useful, um, except it's online, which is not very helpful um, when, when you're walking um, down Piccadilly Circus. But I think, you know, suffice to say that Landsec, the company that owned this site, they're aware that this stuff is a little bit sensitive and it's a little bit weird, and that using data about human emotion, using biometric data about the body to target and profile people is problematic. Um, this might make the point a little bit better. So it says here, in terms of what the technology is doing, um, they're not using facial recognition per se, rather they're kind of, like, they're kind of collect, just collecting data points around the face, but they're not taking an image of the face. But yeah, approximate sex, age, mood, based on whether you're frowning and laughing and whether emotions are positive or negative. But it's just interesting, you know, they, they see the need um, to put um, kind of public disclosures on places where nobody is ever going to read these things. But yeah, so in terms of what are the cameras doing, essentially it's doing this. Um, this, um, so if you want to check it out for yourself, um, you can download an app to your phone, um, uh, Affectiva. If you search it, Affectiva, a facial coding company. And yeah, you can try it for yourself. But in essence, what's happening is this. Dots around the eyes, dots around the nose, dots around the mouth. And as the face moves, you emote. So um, if you think, <laughs> I do this with my students. I tell them to think of something disgusting. I tell them what it is, but I realize this has been live streamed. So I'm not going to suggest anything too disgusting. But if you think of something that's kind of a little bit, uh, there's an expression that happens. The nose wrinkles, the lips go up, and you can see these data points will move in relation um, to that. So in terms of kind of emotions such as disgust, contempt, anger, fear, joy, sadness, these are debatably and arguably can be tracked. But in that sense, oh, and I should say this image is taken from me just starting on a flight to New York. So I'm very happy, but I'm not sure the expression is the same when I land after um, a long, tiring flight. But all of these technologies, they sound a little bit whiz-bang. They sound a little bit gee-whiz. And, you know, it's, it's, it's always a temptation when you're kind of giving these kinds of talks to try and kind of flash and impress with technologies. But, but this stuff's been around for a while. I think it's really important to note that the principle of tracking human emotion goes to the very origins of consumer psychology. So I appreciate we probably have a few psychologists in the room. So this is um, Wilhelm Wundt, um, arguably the father of consumer psychology. And again, using devices to track attention and intention. He also did work on tracking heart rates as well to infer emotional states. So even all the way back in kind of the 1880s, we see the use of technology to track and media and interact with human emotion. In consumer psychology, and it's worth knowing, noting that people like Harlow Gale, you know, very titans of the American advertising industry in particular, studied under Wilhelm Wundt. So the connection's been there for quite a while. Um, Duchenne is also worth a mention as well. Um, so this is um, Guillaume um, Duchenne writing in the 1860s. Now what he did, he did something really interesting. In essence, what he did, he, these here are electrodes, and he used electrodes to stimulate people's faces to generate emotional expression. It didn't hurt, apparently. Um, the reason why Duchenne gets cited is because, as we'll come, I'll show in a second, he was one of the first really to kind of perfect a taxonomy of human emotions. Earlier experimenters actually um, inserted into the skin, into the muscle itself, and that really is pretty gruesome stuff. Um, but he did not, um, apparently this wasn't painful. So this is the kind of stuff that he did. Again, using electrodes. So although this guy looks in pain, he's not. It's just, he's literally, it's just that the muscles are being stimulated. But Duchenne was one of the first to build a taxonomy of human emotion. Reason why this matters is that these taxonomies, in terms of sadness, in terms of surprise, in terms of disgust, and so on and so forth, 
this, this way of phrasing, this way of measuring, this way of, of um, coding emotion sits at the heart of modern technology today. So basically, it goes back to uh, Lazar's point earlier that the past is still with us. We haven't outgrown it. But it raises questions. And, you know, perhaps this is the most important question. Is do we always smile when we're happy? And are we always happy when we smile? And of course, you can exchange happy for other emotions at will. So basically, does emotional behavior correlate with what we're actually feeling? You know, do these technologies, do these methods of detecting emotion actually make any sense? And I think you know, it's quite problematic. Um, and I think there's a, it's perhaps not something we've got time to get into today. Um, but yeah, methodologically, it's very debatable whether people have a basic suite of emotions or whether emotion is something a little bit more different and we kind of think of it more on an affective continuum. So yeah, so these are some of the issues. So in terms of the basic emotions, Paul Ekman and Wallace Friesen, um, they picked up Duchenne's work and kind of really ran with it to talk about pre-programmed universal basic emotions. This worldview has been considerably criticized and by Lisa Barrett in the US and Mark Andrejevic um, in relation to uh, technology. And you know, what they talk about, they talk about kind of a more kind of social idea in terms of people categorizing their physiological reactions using socially derived knowledge about emotion. So for example, if you take a word like jealousy, jealousy, you have a really strong reaction when you feel jealousy. It's, it's a pretty gutsy thing to go through. But the notion of jealousy can't be biologically pre-programmed because jealousy is a quintessentially human idea. It's a social idea. Jealousy doesn't exist with stardust. Uh, that kind of stuff. It doesn't exist in the others. It's a social idea. So I think this is kind of a real problem. And I think in terms of those who use these types of technologies, they talk about technologies, they talk about emotion as, way, as things that can be linked, as a more authentic way of understanding primal emotion, if you like. So I think in short, what you have is a mismatch between methodology and what emotions and affect really is. Um, so in short, I think this is, this is um, we're kind of in a slightly kind of dangerous situation in that we have methodologies being used to detect human emotion, which are convenient for technologists because you can code happiness, as I got on the camera there, or disgust. They're very capturable emotions. But whether that's the sum total of what emotional life is, is highly, highly, highly debatable. Psychologists are divided on this, but generally they refute the basic emotions worldview. In advertising, that might not matter terribly, but think in terms of insurance, think in terms of kind of use in education, think in terms of kind of use of border controls, think of other places where it's any place where it's useful to understand how a person is feeling, whether they're lying, then this stuff does start to matter. So yeah, so I did, I did some um, primary research on this. And one of the things that I was really interested in knowing about is um, citizen attitudes towards emotion capture technologies. And I asked about a range of things, including online sentiment analysis, um, voice assistance in the home, um, wearables, tracking moods and emotion. But one question I asked was about advertising. And this is what I asked them. So I asked them over 2,000 people in the UK from a variety of demographics across the full demographic spectrum, so um, that's for age, that's for gender, that's um, for location, um, and, edu and education and income. Basically, it was a full spread UK survey, 2,000 plus, and it was an online survey. Perhaps not methodologically the best um, way of doing it, but online surveys do have their benefits in that people can time shift, answer when they want, um, rather, and they don't have an interviewer in front of them pressuring them for an answer. Basically, people are free to answer when and how they want. But anyway, this is what I asked them. So I said, advertising agencies have developed outdoor ads equipped with cameras that scan onlookers' faces to work out our emotions towards the ad. If our reactions are not positive, the ad changes itself to be more appealing. Which of the following best represents your feeling about this? So this was what the option that they had so they would say, actually, I'm not OK with data about me being collected in this way. Second option was that, actually, I'm OK with data collected about my emotions as long as the information is anonymized and can't be associated with me, my email address, phone number, or any other possible means of identifying me. 
Three was they let it all hang out, um, and Sam. And that people could say, well, actually, I'm okay with people collecting data about my emotional state, and I'm okay for things, this to be linked with personal information held about me. And for no idea, don't know. So I'm quite interested to know from you what your thoughts are about this. What do you think? So if we do... One second. So, okay, so can I have a hands up, please, for one? So I'm going to, so you're going to, I'm going to go through a series of one, two, three, and four. I'm going to go back to the um, possible answers in a moment. Okay, so hands up for one. Okay, so the, so the answer there, I'd say that's around a third of the room. Um, hands up to number two. Ooh, that's a bit more. I, that looks to me, that's probably around 45% of the room. So who's going to let it all hang out with number three? Okay, nobody likes that one. <coughs> and four don't know. Okay, that's interesting. So, yeah, so I think, you know, I think the majority of you went for number two uh, rather than number one. Um, in terms of um, what the UK said, this is what they said. Um, so, yeah, so just, 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 and I go to the second decimal place for a reason, just under 50% um, said that they're not okay with data being collected about them in this way. 33% um, kind of, yeah, um, kind, of, um, uh, kind of okay with them. I think that was the uh, majority here. So it's interesting that, um, that there's that, that's kind of flipped. 8% 8, 8 of the UK said, yeah, they don't get it, they're happy totally. Um, four don't know. I'm sorry, nine percent um, don't know. But yeah, I think one of the things that was interesting for me that when I kind of got the the overall results through, um, gender made no difference, education made no difference, um, location made no difference. The only thing that made a difference was age, and age really kind of skewed the results. So. This is, um, if I segment using age, apologies for the uh, Microsoft -y table there, um, but you can kind of see kind of that's different. So let me just kind of talk you through. So you've got kind of here, that's not okay at all, which is the first one you voted on. Two, it's the majority one that you voted on. And then three and four. So four, don't know. Three, let it all hang out. Two, okay, um, as long as it doesn't personally identify. One, not at all. And if you can walk your way through, through the 16 to 24s, the 35 to 44s, and so on and so forth, you kind of begin to see a difference there. So overall, 50% um, was um, not okay. Here, for kind of younger people, it's 34%. In short, what you're actually seeing in front of you is that younger people are kind of a slightly more accepting of these technologies. They're slightly more accepting of emotion tracking technologies. But something really interesting happens when you factor for having, for having it connected with personally identifiable information. Young people still really don't like that. And that for me is interesting because sometimes we can get into conversations when, it, when we talk about kind of um, digital and post-digital and social media. And certainly advertising agencies that I talk to, they always say, oh, the kids, they use social media. But they don't care. That's not what I find. What I find is that People are interested in new means of interactive experiences. They're interested in new ways of engaging with technologies, uh, but, they don't w but they want to be in control of the process. And that, that for me, kind of feels kind of intu intuitively true as well. But it really is kind of worth bearing in mind, particularly as we start thinking about kind of um, policy, certainly for the UK. And I'm just going to go backwards. So I'll go forward one more. Now, this figure is really important because at present within the UK, we have 50% of citizens don't like this stuff. They don't want it in their cities. At present, nobody's stopping um, advertising agencies and media site owners doing this. So for me, this kind of raises a few issues. Um, yeah, I talked, so in addition to doing um, UK survey work, I did around 100 interviews talking to policymakers in Europe, um, talking to technologists um, in the US and the UK and elsewhere and around Europe. But this, um, this, uh, from, this is from the European Commission. Um, she's been anonymized here, but essentially say, she says, yeah, this stuff is legal 
and doesn't require consent if the information collected does not qualify as personal data. The interview was done in 2015, so it's pre-GDPR, and even at this stage, she's basically said to me that GDPR, we slightly effed it up. Um, there are kind of things that kind of, um, kind of coming through into GDPR, and we're not capturing harms even in kind of anticipatory legislation. Legislation isn't even here, and we're not capturing the harms that are around today. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an issue. But it's also interesting as well talking to the legal community. And I talked to um, a QC, I talked to um, a couple of partners um, at media law firms, and they actually have different views. I mean, do we have any legal people here? Anybody from a legal background? Okay, um, so yeah. <laughs> A couple. So what I thought is interesting because th th there's been no landmark cases in this. Nobody's actually gone. Nobody's actually kind of said. Actually, I'm really unhappy with having emotions about um, uh, data about my emotions collected in public spaces. Nobody's actually brought that case yet. So Nabora is a media agency, a media law, law firm. And he basically told me that consent's always required. If consent's required, that means it's kind of um, that's a whole different ballgame because GDPR is applicable for the basis that, that people could always be re-identified in some way, shape, or form. I don't buy that line, um, but that was his argument. Um, Tim Pitt Payne is a Queen's counsel from the UK, and basically he said legality hinges upon whether it's singled out. This, in essence, is the standard default possession um, that lawyers had taken. But this third one, I think, is really interesting. Um, this is from the media law firm Allswan. And basically, he told me that privacy law has flexibility and that there is scope for cases to be brought on the ba basis that if people feel aggrieved by what is taking place in a public space. And for him, he says dignity is key. And when he talks about dignity, it doesn't necessarily mean it just in kind of a moral, ethical, liberal sense, but rather he kind of, take, he kind of takes recourse to Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which talks about respect for dignity um, respect and dignity for family life and communications. But he says that the, kind of, there's been a shift in the UK towards the respect and dignity element to the extent that he thinks case could be brought on this. So, I think, so in terms of the legality of this stuff, um, everything's still up for grabs, I think. So yes, I think you know, in terms of um, perhaps a question to take ourselves into the fireside chat with, um, you know, I kind of I leave us with this question, thinking about what the kind of post-digital ethical and policy implications are of the proposition that data might be sensitive and intimate about human emotions, but it's still not like legally personal. So yeah, perhaps um, I'll leave it there. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, uh, so-called neuromarketing in business, so we have a couple of researchers uh, would go out and um, um, sell their services to, uh, to businesses. They would use uh, devices to measure involuntarily brain and physio physiological response of um, uh, people watching some, let's say, advertising material or a shop or a shelf, et cetera, and trying to devise some uh, <laughs> A specific or uh, allegedly undeniable um, uh, uh, advice to how the uh, company should sell their product. Yeah, so uh, so new marketing, you know, we hear a lot about it today, but the kind of use of kind of EEG in terms of kind of brain scanning technologies um, and kind of other kind of ways of kind of tracking the body. I think as I kind of mentioned, one of the earliest slides has really been around beginning kind of 1880s with the origins of consumer psychology itself, but EEG tracking to the 1950s, 1960s. But yeah, we hear a lot about kind of neuromarketing day over the last kind of 10, 15 years. Um, in terms of how, when you say, how do I feel about it? Do you, do you what, well, try and rephrase the question. So, uh, the, perhaps technology cannot uh, actually see if we are happy or not. They, can, gotcha. they can, can only detect smile. But um, can technology in this instance actually detect how we feel about the particular advertisement? I think, I, I think you know, the, these are emerging technologies, and I think this is work in progress. I think if you talk to any new marketing firms privately rather than what they say on a stage, um, 
they admit that the technologies, there are limitations in terms of what they can do. Of course, when they're kind of given kind of a, 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 kind of a big pitch, they'll say something different. So the technologies are not perfect, but they are improving. So in terms of kind of the type, in terms of the use of kind of facial coding, the technologies are improving. So in terms of can they detect emotion, can they detect reactions, um, they can. Um, and I think it's fair to say that, yeah, there is a correlate. If you're kind of tracking somebody's respiration or tracking somebody's heart rate in relation to an ad, um, then, yeah, you know, you, you can't, there is some merit in doing that. I think it was interesting, Chris, that you mentioned the Dove um, example this morning, um, Evolution. Uh, that, that, got, that, that went through so much neuromarketing um, before the thing actually got released. And it's kind of quite a famous case example in neuromarketing. And, and I think you see the emotional peaks and troughs. Um, and I think, yeah, it's quite a powerful example where it can actually work. Uh, I think I will ask the same question afterwards to, to Ms. Einstein, but for now, I would like to have your take. Um, the statistics that are showing the, the hatred towards facial recognition in the UK, is it maybe related to the fact that in 2011, the Flickr gallery and the internet were full of faces of the rioters that were participating in London riots? Because there was this entire scandal of actually faces of rioters being published without their consent. And then the discussion that happens afterwards, which was specifically regarding the privacy of those people, is being like a very scandalous question in place during those times. So. Is it maybe possible that the UK nation is having severe issues with the history of the UK, uh, non-consensually tackling their content, their faces, and not asking them for their approval when it's about CCTV or public cameras or anything related to that? Okay, so, so can I, if I rephrase the question slightly, then is it that the UK is so used to having um, surveillance cameras in place that when we have additional levels of tracking in place, who cares? Is that the question? Yes, but also specifically to 2011 L London riots, that after the riots ended, basically Cameron was, as far as I know, publishing faces of the people who were headliners of the riots themselves. So there, there is a practice in place that showed in the history that it was not the, the nicest type of practice when we talk about pictures of people that are taken without their consent. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, mean, I, I think in terms of the use of surveillance cameras in the UK, the, the UK has the highest density of surveillance cameras in the world before 2011. I think just to kind of slightly kind of jump the 2011 issue in terms of where we are today, um, facial recognition is on the rise and um, lots of police forces are testing and something that as surveillance scholars were kind of once theorizing and speculating about um, is arriving really quickly. So we often kind of look to China and elsewhere for kind of examples of um, where facial recognition is ubiquitous. Uh, we're not, we're, we're heading that direction in the UK as well. Can I, can I build on that one, if that, that's okay? Uh, what I actually literally inspired by, by the question I wanted to ask you, is the uh, attitude uh, towards privacy culturally framed in any particular way? So uh, picking up on the UK thing, where uh, the UK population does know actually that the uh, uh, density of surveillance cameras is one of the highest in the world. Uh, there were scandals and, some, uh, and also the, the, the overall level of awareness of the privacy is also kind of higher. Did you see any cultural artifacts between different societies in that regard? Yeah, I mean, I, so in terms of the cultural bit, I have, I'm, I'm actually working on a cross-cultural study between UK and Japan and privacy attitudes in relation to emotional life, but I haven't got the data in for it yet. But what we did do, we did do um, a kind of survey, a survey, a meta-survey of all the privacy surveys that have been done on the UK. And UK citizens are surprisingly concerned. I think basically what you have to do, if you change the word privacy, for control over personal data, UK citizens get really interested. Um, a recent survey, um, our UK media regulator is Ofcom. They did some work with the Information Commissioner's Office looking at perceptions of advertising technologies or ad tech. Um, again, as soon as people understand how ad tech works, tolerance for it drops enormously. This was something which came out a few weeks ago. So I, the idea that kind of British citizens are kind of passive and just kind of okay, we'll put up with this, that's not really the case. I think it's more the case that they don't know who to complain to. Um, uh, Joseph Turo in the US at Annenberg, he calls it digital resignation. I, that seems to me quite a good phrase um, for, what, for, the, for UK attitudes as well. So we're not happy about it. Hello. Hi. I'm Master Editor-in-Chief in Radio Television Serbia, so I would please you to tell something to us about your school of music and media, just where you're coming from, if you can. Okay, uh, not, the not the question I was expecting. 
quick one. So, yeah, so um, I work at Bangor University. Bangor University is in North Wales, um, within the UK. School of Music Media, um, yeah, the media school is around kind of 30, 40 people. Um, we specialize in politics, um, surveillance, and journalism, um, music side of things, lots of classical music, and, um, and ethnomusicologists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.